Well, Danny, we are usually on the other side of the Jordan River together, but today we are in the land of Jordan. We are at an amazing biblical site. Tell us where we are, my friend. My friend, this is such a great day. Uh, a nice uh, um, spring day, beautiful, clear view of the Israeli side of the Dead Sea. But we are in Jordan facing Michvar, Machaerus, Mukawar. You can call it any name you want. This is such a significant site for Christianity. Yeah, now someone very significant uh, spent time here, lost his life here. None other than John the Baptist. Indeed. We're going to get into all of that. This was a Herodian fortress, the great builder of the Holy Land. And really, Danny, uh, this is kind of an extension of the Holy Land, right? Where we're standing right now, this territory of Jordan, the Dead Sea's right there. Uh, set the scene for us about where we are and some of the biblical history here. Sure. First of all, in the time of the Old Testament, it's part of the Holy Land. This is the lot of God and Reuven. But in Roman times, when Herod is appointed by the Romans, he's also controlling this part. And most of his desert fortresses are on the western side of the Great Rift Valley or the Dead Sea. In fact, you can see from here Masada, uh, Horkania. Uh, you can actually see Masada from where we're standing right now in Especially Jordan. Especially today. It's such a clear, a clear day. Yeah, I can see it right there. Okay, Horkania should be there. Herodium, which Herod humbly named after himself, should be on the hilltop. Jerusalem, Bethlehem. Uh, the fortresses uh, above Jericho, they're all visible from here. And this is one of the reasons why Herod decides to put another desert fortress on the eastern side, on the most protected remote part of his kingdom, but also with aerial view to the other spots. Yeah. Now you and I were at Masada on a previous episode of The Watchmen. Uh, talk a little bit about Herod's motivation uh, on building these great fortresses, including the one we're going to talk about today right here in Jordan, Mukawar. Sure. He's, he's appointed by the Romans. He has to provide a lot of taxes to them in return. The public does not like to be taxed, okay? So he's very cruel if needed. We know that also from the New Testament. He kills babies. He kills his wife if needed, okay? And he's <laughs> paranoid that uh, they might rebel against him, the, the public. So he makes desert fortresses throughout mostly the Judean kingdom, some of the Samaria uh, desert area, okay? And there's about six or seven of them. Masada is the most famous one, but it's just one of a few. And our side over here, Mukawar, is the only one that he also builds on the eastern side of the valley. Very interesting. Uh, Mukawar, uh, John the Baptist, we're going to get into all of this today. We're going to go on top of this ancient, uh, historic, legendary fortress here. Um, talk a little bit more, if you can, about Christianity, Danny, and how in Jordan, we think obviously of the Holy Land of Israel, but right here in Jordan, some very significant events in the history of Christianity uh, went down, including the baptism of Jesus. By the way, he was baptized on the Jordanian side of the river. Yes, it, it, the text says it was in Bethany beyond the Jordan. So if, if John the Baptist is coming from the mountains of Jerusalem, as the Gospel of Luke tells us, as an adult, he goes into the desert wearing camel hair, eating locusts and, and, and calling for people to repent and prepare. The Messiah is arriving. And he will do this at the Jordan River, but on the other side, on the eastern side of it. That's another great place to visit and shoot. And um, eventually he becomes uh, so popular that he dares to speak against the king of his time, Antipas. Okay, Herod Antipas, or Herod Jr. Son of Herod the Great, who built these fortresses. He, well, Herod Sr. built them. Herod Jr. Yes. still uses them, enjoys them. Yes. And John the Baptist is so popular that he, he, feel, he feels confident to speak against the king himself for he was uh, misbehaving. Now why, we know the biblical narrative in the Gospels, Danny, why did John the Baptist speak against Herod Antipas? Okay, in Judaism, you're supposed to be uh, uh, married only to one woman, to your wife. But kings thought uh, they could uh, get away with it. Herod definitely did. He had, I think, eight or nine wives. And Herod Antipas was married, and yet he was courting uh, over his brother's, or half-brother's wife, Herodias. So basically his sister-in-law he was courting. Yes, yes. Wow. And she's married to his uh, semi-brother. And John the Baptist dares to rise and say, this is wrong. Even that you are king, you should not do this. It's against Jewish law. 
Now, this infuriated uh, not only Herod Antipas, who by the way, the gospel show was intrigued by John, it seems like a bit. He listened to him, he was very interesting, almost feared him maybe we see later on. It's confusing. Herod yes. had several children, some of them are called Herod. Yeah. Even the official name of Antipas is Herod Antipas. That's how he's called in the gospel. That's how he calls himself on the coins that he means. And now he is courting around a family member who's also called Herodia, yeah. <laughs> okay? Uh, and yet it's against Jewish law. At least uh, that uh, contradicts clearly Jewish law. So John the Baptist dares to criticize him over this, and Antipas in return will lock him in his most remote desert fortress right here. Right here, John the Baptist. Do we know how long, it was it over a year? Do we know how long he was locked up here in the fortress? The duration is not mentioned, yeah. but what the text does tells us, and by the way, not only through the gospels, also Josephus records this, that eventually uh, Herodias plots how to put John the Baptist to death yeah. in a very interesting way. Uh, she sends her daughter, Saloma to dance in front of the king. Uh, Victorian England will make a, a play out of this in which Salome dances an erotic dance wearing seven scarves. And in each part of the dance, she takes one more scarf off. At the end, what the king sees is very pleasing to a male's eye. And he's so excited that he asks her, what would you like? and she consults with her mom, and what does her mom ask for? The head of John the Baptist. On a silver platter, and Antipas says, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. He might have been drinking, I think, during this party, during this night as he was watching. But Danny, once he committed to give Salome anything she wanted, she asked for the head of John the Baptist, who her mother hated, because as you said, John called out the adulterous affair. Uh, Herod Antipas was kind of painted into a corner, as they say. There was nothing he could do. He did this, he made this pledge in front of all these dignitaries and some of the high dignitaries from the Galilee region, the Bible says, and then he had to deliver what was asked. Yeah, it's an interesting Reluctantly, juicy... by the way, the Gospels say, reluctantly he did it, it seems. Well, it happened. <laughs> it did. It happened and that is uh, approved or documented also by Josephus. And it happened here. And it happened in Mukawel. John the Baptist was beheaded right here. And, and that is a fundamental, a pivotal moment in the cradle of Christianity because John the Baptist is baptizing people at the Jordan River. Jesus is baptized and when he comes out of the water, a voice is heard, a dove appears, the voice says, this is my son who I have chosen. Okay, but then the text tells us that there is a certain, I don't know, a conflict because both Followers of Jesus and followers of John the Baptist are baptizing people now, okay? Almost as if there's some conflict or some animosity between the two groups. But if there was, the beheading of John the Baptist, the removal of, of one of those heads clears the way to unification with the Jesus movement or what we will know is his, from a historical point of view is Christianity and it takes off. And you know, it's interesting, the Bible says that when Jesus heard of the death of John the Baptist, Danny, he was, he was shaken up, I guess you would say, he was shook up. He went off to a remote area uh, to be alone. And Jesus had said, among all the men who have lived, none has been greater than John the Baptist. That's how highly he thought of John. So what we're going to do now, now that we have the historical backdrop and you unpacked it for us beautifully as always, Danny, we are going to go on top of this legendary fortress, Mukawar, and get a closer look, maybe look at some of the conditions that John the Baptist lived under and, and kind of the Herod the Great's great engineering and building mind, the Roman presence. We're gonna discuss all of it. Danny, lead the way, my friend. Let's go. Let's, let's go. go. Let's go climbing. Yalla. Yalla. Well, Danny, we are here. We are on top of Mukawar, uh, the spot where John the Baptist uh, was imprisoned was beheaded. Amazing, amazing biblical history, central role in the history of Christianity. But let's take it to more recent history first. When was this spot discovered and excavated? Yeah, so some 30 years after John the Baptist is beheaded here, uh, Jewish rebels take over the place and the Romans will conquer it. To this day, one can see remains of the Roman siege. It's very reminiscent of Masada in some ways, yes, Danny. Yes, there's a similar story. And in fact, there was uh, more Jewish heroism here. They did fight back, but at the end, the Romans captured one of the rebels and uh, threatened to execute him. 
and the Jews gave up. Now this was in the year AD 72? Yes, thereabouts. it's after the fall of Jerusalem and before the fall of Masada. Yes, Jerusalem fell in AD 70 to the forces of Titus. The, the temple destroyed, obviously, Jerusalem. Uh, then the Jewish rebels come out here to the desert. Yeah, and the They're Romans the come after them. Yes. And by 72, it is over. And what's interesting is that the site will never be in use again, not by the Jews and not also by the Christians. Maybe they forgot the location of the site. They didn't know that this is where John the Baptist was executed. It's an archeological fact. There was no church built here later. So the location was forgotten. Unlike Masada, where you showed us before, Danny, there was a monastery built on top of Masada. Yeah, it's very interesting that there was a monastery there and that there was none over here, yes. but that's the archeological fact. And then both sites are abandoned, forgotten, and only in 1807, a Danish uh, scholar called Zetsen will climb to the top and suggest this is the place. And only in the 1970s will it finally be properly excavated on a large scale yeah. uh, by a Franciscan team. A few years ago, a Hungarian archaeologist came back and he was the one also to reposition two columns of the interior court and of the palace. We're going to take a walk around here, by the way, in, yeah. in a minute, these ruins. But Danny, this is amazing to me. This spot, central again to the Christian faith, this lie dormant for about 1800 years. Yes. Unbelievable. And even now that it's known, where are the crowds? <laughs> Great question. Uh, we've been talking about uh, that Jordan uh, is an extension of the Holy Land. Really, in biblical times, it was part of the Holy Land where we are standing right now. Where are the crowds? Yeah, uh, it just suffers from bad PR, I guess. It's not yeah. known enough. Uh, there's no visitor center. Also, they didn't reconstruct much of the site. Remember in Masada, yes. there was quite a lot of it redone. Very well preserved. Uh, but I, I would expect so many more busloads of Christian excited pilgrims to come here and chant and commemorate the memory of the forerunner of Jesus. He was a, a forerunner of Jesus, a voice crying in the wilderness. Me, as a follower of Jesus, Danny, myself, I can say, I'm ecstatic to be up here. I'm pinching myself. I can't believe that I'm standing on the spot where John the Baptist was uh, imprisoned, uh, beheaded. This is, this is a very serious thing uh, for any Christian. So yeah, you'd expect the tour buses to be rolling up. Hopefully with this episode of The Watchman, we will change all that Yalla. and more tour. Yes, come on. I'm all in favor. Yes, yes. And let me show you a bit more of the uh, details of the site. Let's do it and we will talk about maybe Salome's dance. and Where was it? Where yeah. was it? Let's go take a look. <laughs> 